My name is Flash Isaac and I'm a teacher from the future. When I was much younger, I saw thousands and thousands of people fail jam and unable to gain admission. This made me travel in time. Now I am back with the Flash Letter Jam app and a series on YouTube tagged 120 Days to Jam. My mission is to help you blast jam and as well get justice for everyone who jam has served breakfast. You are welcome to another beautiful episode of the 120 Days to Jam Physics with Flash IZ. In this episode, we shall be looking at Introductory Electronics. This episode requires us to know certain things about electronics and the major focus is semiconductors. At the end of this episode, we are going to learn a lot of things when it comes to find out fundamentals of electronics and the band field and electronic field. Let us take a look at band theory. Matter exists in three states. The solid state, the liquid state, and the gaseous state. The difference between the solid state of matter, the liquid state of matter, and the gaseous state of matter is um, the force of attraction between the molecules. It's how close the molecules are. For gases, the molecules are far apart. For liquids, a little bit clo uh, close, closer than the way they are in gases. But for solids, the molecules are close apart. They are very close. The force of attraction between molecules is strong. They are very, very close. Now, since they are close, a molecule can move into the orbiter of neighboring atom. It moves into the orbiter of neighboring atom, which means there is overlap of orbitals in solid. And that overlap is what forms what you refer to as energy band. Intermissing of orbital. Now, what is an orbital? When you look at atomic theories, you see that is atomic theory. J.J. Thompson, Rutherford, Nebo's atomic theory. They all did their best to explain atoms. However, three big boy scientists, men like Erwin Schrodinger, Louis de Brock, and Wana Heisenberg, they proposed the theory of orbital. We have three types of energy band or three bands. We have the valence band. We have the conduction band. And the energy band or energy gap. Forbidding band. Or forbidding gap. These are the energy bands when you come to band theory. What is valence band or what is conduction band or what is forbidden gap? If you have this atom like this, 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 or let's say like this, you look at something. This atom or this element has 12 electrons, 2 here, 8 here, 10, and 2 in the outermost shape. Now, this electron in the outermost shape of an atom is referred to as valence electron, which means the energy band that contains valence electron is the valence band. So which means here, these are electrons in the outermost shape. Hope you understand that. Let's go to conduction band. Although the valence electrons are electrons in the outermost shell, not all the valence electrons become free. Because for conduction to take place, we must have what to refer to as free electrons. Free electrons. These are electrons that must be ready to be put out, to be free to move. So, the band that contains free electron is simply the conduction band. 
Then the forbidden gap is simply the energy gap. It contains no free electrons. It has no electron in it. Now, like I said, for conduction to take place, the distance or the separation between the valence band and the conduction band must be small. Let's look at conductors. For conductors, you see the electrons in the conduction band, electron in the valence band, and there is basically no space between the conduction band and valence band. So electrons are allowed to move, so they conduct. Examples of conductor, copper, silver, <laughs> aluminium. These are good examples of conductors. Now for insulators or uh, no metals or no conductors, you see that the distance between the conduction band and valence band, which is the forbidden gap, is very wide. Now, for this thing to conduct electron, it needs external force to pull this to here, here, electrons from the valence band to conduction band. But since the distance is so so wide, it may be very difficult for this to conduct. Now let's go to semiconductors. Semiconductors, they also have conduction band, valence band, and the forbidden band or forbidden gap. But the forbidden band or the forbidden gap is narrow, very narrow. Therefore, we shall need external force to make these semiconductors conduct. And like I said, the process of making semiconductors to conduct electricity, it has to be doping. Doping. Because you need to add impurities, external impurities, to semiconductors so that they are able to conduct. Example of insulator, rubber, yeah, plastic is an insulator. Then, semiconductors, the top semiconductors are silicon and germanium. Or germanium, or germanium. These are the top semiconductors. Now, for germanium or germanium, the Forbidden gap is 0 0.7 electron volt. That is the forbidden gap. Why for silicon, the forbidden gap is 1.1 electron volt. So, band theory, valence band, conduction band, and forbidden gap. Do you understand this? For semiconductors, conductivity increases with temperature, which means as temperature increases, the conductivity we increase. Semiconductors are covalently bonded. In pure state, semiconductors are insulators or poor conductors, which means generally semiconductors they don't conduct electricity in their pure state. And pure semiconductors are referred to as intrinsic semiconductors. Impure semiconductors are referred to as extrinsic semiconductors. So pure in impure S uh your S you always refer to that as impure bad character so you can take it that way S impure in pure now the carriers of currents in semiconductors are holes and electrons conductors they charge or they carry current based on electrons electrons are mainly charge carriers in conductors, but semiconductors they conduct by means of holes and electrons. If you see the diagram I drew in energy band under semiconductor, you notice something like this. In the valence band, there is H, which refers to as holes. Then here, conduction band you have electrons. So this is the forbidden gap. So semiconductors, they conduct by means of holes and electrons. Holes are positively charged carrier or positive charge carrier, while electrons are negative charge carrier. So the magnitude of the charge of the holes and electrons, they are equal but opposite. So holes, positive charge carriers, electrons, negative charge carriers. Semiconductors, they conduct by means of holes and electrons now the majority carrier is the one that is in excess if we have more electrons than holes in a semiconductor we simply say that 
electrons are majority carrier. If we have more holes than electrons in this semiconductor, we say that majority carriers are holes. Now, the ones that we have less, they are the minority carrier. If we have less holes than electrons, holes are minority carriers, while electrons are majority carriers. So these are the values for conductivity and resistivity of semiconductors. Now, let's take a look at doping. Remember, we said that semiconductors do not conduct in their pure state. They don't. For semiconductors to conduct, we need to add impurity to them. Now, adding impurity doesn't mean pack sand and put or pack anything and put. No, that is not the meaning. Adding impurities to semiconductors simply means adding other elements. And the elements we need to add to semiconductor, the impurities for semiconductors to conduct, they are simply group 3 or group 5 elements. These are impurities we add to semiconductors. Remember, pure semiconductors or good examples of semiconductors, silicon and germanium. And these are in group 4. Group 4 simply means they have 4 valence electrons. They have 4 electrons in the outermost shape. Now, by the time you add impurities or these elements to semiconductor, the process is referred to as doping. Which means, for semiconductors to convert, they need to be doped. They need to dope. That is doping. Now, what are group 3 elements? The group 3 impurities added to semiconductors are referred to as trivalent impurities. Tri, because group 3 elements, we simply have 3 elements, 3 electrons in the outermost shape. While the group 5 elements or group 5 impurities are referred to as pentavalent. Pentavalent simply means 5. So pentavalent elements, they will have 5 electrons in the outermost shape. Take a look at this element. This is phosphorus. Phosphorus has 15 electrons in total. But only five valence electrons, which means electrons in the outermost shape. Boron has uh, five electrons in total, but three in the outermost shape, which means boron has three valence electrons. So phosphorus is pentavalent, five electrons in the outermost shape. Boron is trivalent, three in the outermost shape. Now these elements they can serve as trivalent impurity. Examples of trivalent impurities are, or trivalent elements are, boron, symbol B, gallium, G, aluminium, AL, and indium, IN. These are elements. Then pentavalent elements, phosphorus, P, arsenic, AR, antimony, SB, bismuth, BT. These are pentavalent impurities we add to semiconductors. Now, semiconductor can be P-type or N-type. Whether it is P-type, positive type, or N-type, negative type, depends on the impurity you use. Let's say you use trivalent impurity, boron. What happens? Since boron has three electrons in the atomosphere. sphere, this one comes here, right? The second one comes here. No. It can come anywhere. This is what I'm trying to achieve. Comes here. This comes here. So I don't cross the line. Now what happens? This one is few. This one is few. This one is few. We have one hole left to be filled. Since we have more holes than electron, we form P-type. In P-type, we have extra holes because not enough electron to fill the holes. That is referred to as P-type semiconductor. Which means, when you dope with trivalent impurity, you form P. Look at it, trivalent T, pentavalent P. So when you dope with trivalent impurity, you form P. You can use that to remember. Trivalent impurity gives you P-type. Now, in P-type semiconductor, what is in excess and what is in what is in uh, what is deficient in this case you see that we still have extra hole which means 
For p-type, holes are more than electrons. So holes are majority carriers and electrons are minority carrier. Now let's do something else. This phosphorus, it has three electrons in the atom, five electrons in the atmosphere. It is pentavalent. Now let's dope. This comes here. This comes here. This comes here. This comes here. So this extra electron comes here to stay. Why? There is no hole for it to fill. The holes are filled up, meaning we have extra electrons. What does that imply? Or what does that imply? If you do with any of these pentavalent impurities, you will form a or an n-type semiconductor. For n-type semiconductors, electrons are majority carrier and holes are minority carriers. So bulk of the conduction is as a result of the more electrons or extra electrons. So ladies and gentlemen, do you understand Adobe semiconductor devices? The first one here is the junction diode and the next one is transistors. Diodes are generally devices that allow current to flow in one direction. But in junction diode, current can flow in either direction. They are made up of two terminals, the positive P terminal and the negative N terminal. This is a typical junction diode and this is how diodes look. Positive side and the negative side. The junction diodes, they allow current to flow in both forward and reverse direction. Diodes are generally used as rectifiers. What are rectifiers? Rectifiers are devices that convert AC to DC. Now, the diode has the P-type and the N-type with a small junction. This junction is about 10 raised to the power of minus 6 meter thick. The junction is also referred to as depletion region or potential barrier. The junction experiences opposition and prevents further flow of charge. This is why the junction is also called depletion region or potential barrier. So the diode, the junction diode has a, a junction which is referred to as the depletion region or potential barrier. Now, bias, uh, a diode can be biased or non bias Remember, we said that the process of adding impurity to semiconductor is referred to as doping. But in the case of bias, when there is no battery connected to diode, we say it is non-biased. And when the diode is non-biased, no current flows. So that is diode that is non-biased. No current flows. Before we go deep into that, I wrote some things out. The advantages and disadvantages of diodes. The advantages are no heater, it is very cheap. It has a small side, which means it is very light. The disadvantages are it is temperature sensitive and it conducts lightly in the reverse direction. What does it mean for diodes to conduct lightly in the reverse direction? Look at it. Since diodes, when there is no current or no battery attached to it, we say it is non-biased. Now, in biased, a diode can be forward biased or reverse bias. Forward bias or reverse bias. Now, what is forward biasing and what is reverse biasing? It is a very simple concept. If you take this to be diode, let's say this, and you say this is the positive and this is the negative. If you have a battery, like this if the positive part of the battery is connected to the p, uh, p end and the negative side of the battery is connected to the end, end side we therefore say that this diode is forward biased 
and in forward bias, more current flow because the depletion region will shrink, it will get smaller. Now, a situation where the negative part of the battery is connected to the P end, which is the uh, positive side, and the positive side of the battery is connected to the N end, which is the negative side. In this case, the diode is reverse biased. And in reverse bias, only small current flows. This is why diode will allow current to flow very well in one direction, then smaller amount of current will flow in the reverse direction. If you have this diagram, something like this, and you have a battery, if the plus of the battery goes to plus, minus of the battery goes to minus, it is forward biased. Now, there is a type of diode that allow current to flow very well in both directions. That type of diode is referred to as zener diodes. So in zener diodes, you have something like this. Zener. Current flows very well in either direction. And zener diodes are used for voltage regulation. Now, diodes are used as certifiers to convert AC to DC. They are used as regulator or control in circuits and they are used as switching now when it comes to rectification converting ac to dc you can either use one diode for rectification you can choose to use two then you can choose to use four using one diode for rectification the result will be a half wave that will be the output you have something like this half wave now how, why do we have half wave in half rectification or when we use one diode it is because the diodes allow current to flow in one direction then in the reverse very small current flows therefore this works no current flows here or small current then you get another wave this is the result of using one diode for rectification you get half wave now if you use two diodes you get full wave now for a bridge circuit Something like this, bridges. For bridge circuits, you use four waves. So for half wave replication, one wave, one diode. Full wave, two diodes. For bridge, four diodes. So transistors are three terminal devices. And the three terminals are the emitter, the base, and the collector these are the three terminals of a transistor and in transistor you have the pnp type and the npn type the pnp type they have the two outer parts are positive positive negative positive negative positive and negative pnp and npn transistors now transistors are three terminal devices then they have the three terminals are emitter, base, and collector. If this is a transistor, this is the emitter, this is the base, and this is the collector for PNP. Now for NPN, you see this is the emitter, this is the base, and this is the collector. This is the emitter, this is the base, and this is the collector. Emitter, base, and collector. What is the function of emitter? What is the function of base and what is the function of collector? Let's take it to be this way. If this is your tank, then you have pipes. Then here, you have tap. Here, you have bucket. Let's take this tank to be emitter. Let's take this opening of uh, tab, the tab control, to be the base. Let's take this to be collector. Emitter. Emitter is heavily doped. Heavily doped. Remember, doping is addition of impurity to semiconductors so that they are able to conduct. Now, when you dope heavily, you get emitter. Emitter is heavily doped part of the transistor. Now, it is rich in holes. Holes are positive charge carriers. So, emitter is heavily doped. 
It is rich in holes. And what does it do? What does the tank do? Tank supplies water to the tap. Then when you turn on the tap, it supplies the water to the bucket. Which means emitter supply charge via the base. So the tank supplies the water to the tap. And this tap here is the base. What does base do? Base is lightly doped. Lightly doped. It is poor in electrons. So that when the charge are coming from the emitter to the base, they don't mix up or react. They are able to go straight to the collector. And base is made up of different material from emitter and collector. Emitter, base and collector. The material used in making the base is different from the one used in making the emitter and the one and collector. Which means if this and this have the same material, the base will definitely have a different materials. In summary, transistors, they have made up of different materials. Let's take a look at the collector. The collector, they are lightly doped. They are rich in electrons. Lightly doped, rich in electrons. And what do they do? They collect carriers. They collect charges. The charges can be electrons or holes. But they are charged collector. They collect charges. They collect the carriers. Now, silicon is preferred to germanium for semiconductors because it has smaller cutoff current. The positive terminal of the battery is connected to the P end, and the negative terminal is connected to the N end, which means that the emitter base junction is forward biased. For this part, you see that the positive end is connected to the negative part of the uh, transistor, then the negative part of the battery is connected to the positive part of the transistor. In this case, we say that the collector base junction is reverse biased. So here is forward bias, here is reverse bias. Now, how about we do something like this? If here becomes plus, then it simply means that here is, also, here is forward bias and here is forward bias. That is simply biasing. If positive is connected to positive end, negative is connected to negative end, that is forward biased. In this case, this is NPN transistor. This is the emitter, this is base, and this is the collector. So the base is common between the collector and the emitter. The negative part of the battery, negative terminal, is connected to the N side. Positive is connected to the P side. Which means the emitter base junction is forward biased. In this case, the positive part of the battery is connected to the N side, the negative to the P side. So this other part is reverse bias. And in battery, current will flow from a higher potential to lower potential. So current will always flow from this higher part. Looking at transistors, they can be used as current and power amplification voltage amplification as switch and as electrical oscillators in pnp transistors generally current will flow in while for npn current will flow out there are modes we can operate transistor if you are using transistor as amplifier we therefore use the forward active mode forward active mode When a transistor is forward active or is in forward active mode, it simply means that the emitter base junction is forward biased and the collector base junction is reversed biased. As we can see here, so this is the base, this is the collector base because the, the base is common, collector base emitter base the emitter base junction is forward biased the collector base junction is reverse biased so this is forward active and when the diode is forward active a very high current a forward current will flow and while operating a diode always make sure that the emitter base junction is forward biased so that as much current can flow then a diode can be set up in cutoff mode 
when you want to use diode as a switch, you configure it in cutoff mode. In cutoff mode, both junctions are reverse biased, which means the emitter base junction is reverse biased instead of plus here, here becomes plus, so that negative goes to positive, positive goes to negative. Then here is also reverse biased. In that case, this is in cutoff mode. Saturation mode, when the uh, transistor is used as a closed switch, it is connected in saturation mode. In saturation mode, both junctions are forward biased. The emitter base junction is forward biased, the collector base junction is forward biased, and large collector current will flow. And we also have reverse active mode of connecting transistor. The reverse active mode, in this case, the transistor acts as an inverter. It is the opposite of forward active. So when the transistor acts as an inverter, the emitter base junction is reverse biased, while the collector base junction is forward biased. Emitter base junction is reversed, while collector base junction is forward biased. Because here, yeah, the emitter base junction is forward, collector base junction is reversed. Now, to make transition to a transistor to function as amplifiers, we can connect it as common base, common emitter, and common collector. Common base simply means that the base here is common to both the input and output. Because for amplifier, the input amplifies. Even in your speaker, in your mic, your speaker is amplified. When you give hello, it has a lot of gain. It boosts, it amplifies, signal goes up. That is amplification. So for common base, the base is here, is common to the input and output. In the input, you have emitter and base. In the output, you have base and collector. For the common emitter, the emitter is common between the base, um, between the input and the output. In the input, you have the base and the emitter. In the output, you have the collector and emitter. For common collector, the collector is common between the input and output. In the input, you have base and collector. In the output, you have emitter and collector. When it comes to transistors and electronics, there are more things to be dealt with, like input characteristics, output characteristics, oscillators, amplifiers, and more. Now, this class will stop here. Now, this brings us to the end of this episode. I hope you found something interesting. Feel free to let me know how you feel using the comment box. And don't forget to tell your friends about the Flash Learners YouTube channel. Get the Flash Learners app and begin to play with the specials. See you in the next episode.